Questions to the Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs. Mr Graham Morris. Question number one, Mr Speaker. The Minister of State at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Minister Sir Alan Duncan. Mr Speaker, the Foreign Secretary has spoken to Turkish Foreign Minister Kavishlolu about the operation in Afrin. We have called for de-escalation and for the protection of civilians while recognising Turkey's legitimate interest in the security of its borders, and it remains in our shared interest to focus on achieving a political settlement in Syria. I thank the Minister for that answer, but does the Foreign Secretary recognise that the Kurdish-led administration in Afrin has built a secular democratic system that's worked collaboratively, collaboratively with the international community uh, to defeat Daesh most recently in Raqqa? And does he accept that the international community owes a debt of honour to the Kurds? And will he step up the efforts to stop the bloodshed in and around Afrin? I understand what the Honourable Gentleman is saying, but we must also recognise the legitimate security interests of Syria. And they consider that having launched Operation Olive Branch in January, it is in response to attacks from the Afrin area, and they believe that they are in compliance with proper UN standards. Dr Julian Lewis. When we make representations to our Turkish NATO allies, can we also make representations on behalf of the tens of thousands of journalists and others who have been locked up by the Turkish government? I can assure my right honourable friend that we do, and we do so in all the meetings we have at all levels with our Turkish counterparts. Jane Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the government agree that the Democratic Union Party, the PYD, and the People's Protection Units, the YPG, should be included within the Geneva process to end Syria's war and discuss the country's future? Um, that is primarily a question on Syria rather than Turkey. However, I would point out to the Honourable Lady that, of course, the PKK is a prescribed organisation in the UK, whereas the organisations to which she principally refers are, of course, not, and so can be spoken to. Mrs Theresa Villiers. Uh, will the Minister make representations to the Turkish Foreign Minister to ask the Turkish Navy to cease obstructing vessels seeking to extract hydro hydrocarbons in the eastern Mediterranean? I understand uh, the issue to which the, my right honourable friend refers, which is the issue of drilling for oil and gas on the edge of Cyprus, and we are assessing uh, what has been reported over the last day or so about what exactly is happening in that area. Emily Thornbury. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, we on this side of the House unequivocally condemn Turkey for their disgraceful assault on Afrin. And we are especially appalled that they have enlisted in their army the very jihadist militias that the Kurdish forces have worked so hard to drive out of northern Syria. If the Foreign Secretary is unable to join me in condemning the T Turkey today, will the Minister of State at least explain why he believes, and I quote, Turkey's legitimate interest in securing its own border gives them the right to brutally attack the innocent Kurdish community in Afrin? I don't think it's exactly as the Right Honourable Lady says. I think that we need to recognise Turkey's legitimate interests. Of course, we condemn any kind of attacks on civilians, and we wish to see a de-escalation of this, but the legitimate rights of Turkey, I believe, should be recognised. Emily Thornbury. Mr Speaker, the truth is, is that the Turkish assault is part of a broader pattern where too many foreign parties engaged in the Syrian civil war are now acting just like the Assad regime itself, without any regard for international law. When this government obtained a military mandate for joining the coalition action in Syria, David Cameron guaranteed this House that it was exclusively, exclusively to combat the, te the threat from Daesh. Given that threat is now almost totally gone, will the Minister of State please spill, spell out the Coalition's current military objectives in Syria, and can I ask, when will he seek a mandate for them from this House? Can I say that I find the right of the Lady's analysis extremely bizarre, particularly as the, y, particularly as the YPG uh, have been reported as wishing to ally themselves with the Assad re regime in order to fight back against Turkey's activity? Mr. Holliburn, Mr. Upon... Further to that point, what is the Minister's assessment of the veracity of reports that the Assad regime and the Kurds are joining forces militarily to resist the Turkish incursion? 
That is exactly the issue to which I have just referred, and we are assessing it, and I'm sure there will be further reports later, but it's too early, I think, to say exactly what may be happening. Jack Presti. Five, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. With permission, uh, I will answer questions 5 and 11 together. Uh, I was able to meet with both Prime Minister Abadi and Kurdish Prime Minister Nitshivan Bazani in Munich at the weekend, when, on behalf of the United Kingdom, I encouraged the continuing dialogue recently begun between them individually, which is essential to the long-term stability of Iraq. We have no current plans for observers from the UK to attend May's elections, but we are working with others to ensure an efficient and effective monitoring. Presty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will then British diplomats study the federal government's progress in implementing the Iraqi constitution, especially in disputed areas like Kirkuk, where there have been reports of murder, looting, looting and expropriation, and where the autonomy promised under the Iraqi constitution is under threat? Well, there's no doubt that both sides see the opportunity under the constitution to ensure that their relationships are strong and good between them. There has been a great deal of conciliation in an area which could be of much greater conflict, and the United Kingdom is encouraging that dialogue in order to minimise the risk of the matters that my hon. Friend raises. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will my hon. Friend accept the Foreign Affairs Committee's observation that many Kurds feel imprisoned in a country they see not as implementing the commitments of equality to them? And would he also not agree the five-month-long blockade of international flights to and from Kurdistan has been a needless outrage, separating families, obstructing medical treatment, impairing the economy. And will he encourage Baghdad to lift the blockade? Again, there is little doubt that the issue of the airport is foremost among the discussions between uh, the respective uh, Prime Ministers, uh, and there is a recognition that if the uh, arrangements could be changed for the airport, it would make a difference. But in relation to that, the future of uh, a Kurdish region in Iraq uh, is, is essential that it is stable and secure, and that rights are honoured on both sides, and that the Constitution is seen to be effective. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have just returned from Iraq myself, and I monitored the first ever elections in Iraq. So while elections are important, I think the Iraqis particularly would like more assistance, technical assistance, advice, and they are doing a good job there uh, at the moment, but they do more, need more UK help in order to bring about reconciliation uh, and progress between the various factions. Um, can I thank the Right Honourable Lady for her steadfast support yeah, yeah, of yeah. Iraq over many years, yeah, yeah. and indeed she and colleagues from the IPU were over to talk to those in the Iraqi parliament about uh, governance issues, uh, and the contribution she's made over many years is immensely valuable. Of course, technical assistance to assist in this process from the United Kingdom uh, is, is part of our support, and uh, I'll certainly be looking into what more we can do in relation to the elections. Speaker, I know the Minister to be a fair-minded man, and when any of these negotiations are taking place, will he balance the loyalty as allies of the Kurdish people uh, over long, many, many long years and balance that with the track record of President Erdogan? Uh, well, uh, in, in relation to uh, the Turkish issue, my right, right hon. Friend made reference to that earlier. Uh, certainly, there is, there is concern about what is happening on the border and a recognition that the needs of Kurdish peoples, which are represented by a number of different parties, are, are recognised. Uh, and the United Kingdom is always conscious of the relationship we have with those peoples and with the people of Iraq. Friend is a, a noted expert on the region, and it is a pleasure to see him representing Her Majesty's government in the Middle East. But could he perhaps bring a little bit of clarity that the Foreign Affairs Committee asked for on the difference between the YPG and the PKK? Because we received evidence after evidence that there is indeed no real difference, and yet Her Majesty's government is supporting a group that appears, at least, uh, uh, at least slightly, linked to a, a group that, as his colleagues said just now, is a prescribed organisation. Um, can I thank the, uh, my honourable friend, uh, not only for his question, but the, the leadership of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, we will study 
uh, that report very carefully. I appreciate that it, it was asking for clarity in some situations which are genuinely difficult to provide the clarity. So there will be a full written response from the, uh, from the Foreign Office in due course. But we do designate uh, PPKK as a prescribed organisation, uh, and, and that is the situation we're in at present. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, we're deeply concerned by recent reports of chemical weapons use in Syria. UK officials are in contact with the Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which is investigating. We condemn all use of chemical weapons and are working with international partners to identify and hold to account those responsible. Thank the Minister for that answer. Now, anyone who seeks to draw a false equivalence between this grotesque gassing of, its own, of their own citizens in Syria risks aiding and abetting this gruesome activity. But the government's concern is not enough. Words are not enough. What is the UK actually going to do to take action to stop this which was supposed to be a red line for the international community which has been walked over time and again? Uh, the right honourable gentleman is, is right to express concern and anger about the, not only the use of chemical weapons but the increase in use. Uh, we think there have been perhaps four occasions since the turn of this year. And if chemical weapons come back into the, the norm of use uh, in, in war, it goes against a century of, uh, of uh, united response by the, by the world against them. Uh, I took part in the recent uh, conference in Paris, uh, led by the French Foreign Minister and the United States Secretary of State, to counter activities in the UN, where the joint investigative me mechanism has been vetoed on three occasions there, to try and create some other mechanism. But he's right, we will continue to work through the UN in order to ensure that the International Convention on Chemical Weapons once again becomes properly effective. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses on this subject. 2018 has proved to be an absolutely brutal year so far for Syrian civilians. What can we do? Well, we can put in place monitoring in this country, and will the Minister say a little bit more about UK government resources for monitoring and collecting evidence of these terrible crimes? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, since the beginning of the conflict in Syria, uh, the UK has been working to equip civilians on the ground with the tools that they needed to collect evidence which could be used in the future to ensure that there was accountability and justice. Uh, we've been doing that work for some years and will continue to do so. But what she calls attention to, the increased use of chemical weapons in the past few weeks, uh, is an outrage. And the, the uh, world community is entitled to be outraged by it, but must indeed ensure that through the UN it does something effective to bring the perpetrators to justice. Mr. Speaker, uh, is the Secretary of State concerned at weekend reports by human rights observers that the civilians of Afran have been subjected to chemical gas attacks by Turkish forces? Is this conduct we should expect from a so called NATO ally? Yeah, yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, any, uh, any suggestion of the use of chemical weapons has got to be independently verified, uh, the degree to which uh, they have become more used in the Syrian conflict by a number of different sources is a matter of great concern, not least what the regime has been doing to people, but any suggestion has got to be properly uh, identified and verified. <laughs>